I've actually played smaller crowds, so this is, uh, I'm comfortable with this. Now, thank you for joining us out here. This is, uh, this is fantastic. How many of you were required to be here? Let me just get that out of the way. Okay, that's okay. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. Uh, like, like Jen was uh, telling, telling you, I am a standard comedian and I'm a native Utahan. Thank you. That was, uh, that was overwhelming. That was a good response right there. Sorry, I want to be right in your face. I want to be right where you are. But uh, now, being a, a Utahn, we are not a proud people, I have learned. Because like, like Jim was saying, I've lived a lot of other places, and people from other states are actually pretty excited about where they're from. You know what I'm talking about? People from California, they get going about California, you can't get them to shut up for five minutes about how amazing California is. Texans. Texas. Native-born Texan, right? Yep. They're easy to spot. No matter what the situation is, whenever they hear Texas mentioned, they lose their freaking minds. That's awesome. But see, Utahns, we're not like that. No, we, when we introduce ourselves, tell you where we're from, we apologize. That's what we do. Sorry, I'm from Utah. Sorry. Think about it. Two things you shouldn't bring up when you meet somebody for the first time, politics and religion. You mention Utah, boom, you just threw both of them right at them right there. Pick it up and deal with it. Uh, no, like Jen said, I am a, a, a stand-up comedian, and uh, getting into stand-up comedy was uh, kind of a fun project. Well, it was a little scary, to be honest with you. Um, most people, in fact, I think this is funny, you find people who uh, are scared to death of the idea of doing stand-up comedy, and this is coming from people who get shot at on a regular basis. You know, I, I did a show for the Utah Highway Patrol, and many of them were like, wow, what you do is amazing. I'm going... Uh, you, you get, you know, half of you people get shot at and killed. Why, what, are you, what are you talking about? You guys are amazing. So anyway, um, my, my journey into stand-up comedy took, took many years. Uh, my wife, amazingly enough, was the one who encouraged me to start doing it because we first got married, I was in the Marine Corps, and I used to do a funny little bit about having a gay drill instructor. Back then it was interesting. Now it's just a thing. Um, but it was a fun, fun thing to do, and so she kept encouraging me to do stand-up, and I kept putting it off, because I always thought stand-up comedy was something I'll do later, when the, when the time is right, when everything's perfect. I'm going to become a stand-up comedian. But right now I'm thinking, I'm not quite ready. I'm going to wait till everything is perfect. So I kept trying to do a lot of different businesses, because I had always decided I wanted to be successful, I wanted to have a lot of money, have all the really cool stuff. And so I kept trying to do everything I could to become rich. I kept going into every, every business opportunity I could find, everything from multi-level marketing, selling knives. I even did that thing where you go around trying to sell perfume to strangers. You ever done that? Tried that one for a day. I just wanted money. That was the thing. I was focused on money. And one day, I, was, I had started a business where we were doing um, basic maintenance for a, management, a property management company in uh, Kansas City, in the Kansas City area. And we would do all the basic maintenance stuff. We'd, you know, somebody's apartment had a leak, had a roof leak, or carpet was coming up. We'd go in there and fix it. One day we were fixing this, this gal's window with, because people would punch the glass out next to her door handle and then reach in, open it up, and go in and steal everything from, from her apartment. And so we'd come up with this idea to use plexiglass instead of glass, right? So that if they punched it, they would just hurt themselves. So we were cutting the, I had a gentleman helping me, and we were cutting the, the, the plexiglass. And as I was holding it for him, and as I was explaining to him, you just kind of score it, and then you pop it. It's the way you cut plexiglass. You don't have to, you aren't going to just cut it with a knife. You have to score and pop it. And as we started trying to do that, he was trying to cut it, and I'm holding it in place. We're doing it on a, out there on an asphalt driveway. He got a little too aggressive with it. 
the knife slipped and it came over and cut the tip of my finger off. So uh, I had to grab, grab my fingertip and my wife was there so she ran me to the hospital. I called another friend of mine to come over and finish the project for me. So I'm sitting there in an emergency room in Kansas City waiting to get my finger sewed back together and I'm thinking to myself, this is not what I wanted to do with my life. This is not, this is, what am I doing? I'm going out and doing all these jobs and I'm not getting anywhere. And so, on the way home, as we're driving back, you know, I'm, and it could have been the fact that I was, you know, hopped up on Demerol at the time, but as we're driving back to the, back to the house, I just looked at my wife and I said, you know, I hate doing this job. I don't want to do this anymore. And she goes, well, what do you want to do? And I go, I want to be a stand-up comedian. And my wife said, it's about time. And so um, over the next few days, I started trying to figure out how to be a stand-up comedian, started looking up everything I could find, calling people. I mean, I had, I had no idea how you become a stand-up comedian. What's the, you know, what's the process? Finally figured out, you have to go to an open mic get up on stage and tell jokes to strangers. Wow, it's that, oh, that's it? That's all you do? Okay, all right, I'll try it. So we found an open mic at a comedy club in Kansas City, it was on Monday nights. I had to pay $10 to get in and a two drink minimum. So uh, you know, not being a drinker myself, I had to buy Sprites and they charged me $5 each. And they were about this tall. Um, and I loved it. First time I got on stage, just absolutely, I, it was a packed house, a lot of people. I got up there, I told a couple jokes, got a mediocre response, uh, had a few chuckles, and thought, yeah, this is it. I'm going to do this. I was horrible at it, but I was having a blast. And so uh, I quit my business. I actually gave it to the gentleman that I had called over to finished the other job for me, and uh, started doing stand-up comedy wherever I could. I would go to the open mic every Monday, and uh, <clears throat> a ge another gentleman pulled me aside one time after one of the shows, and he says, you know, I've seen you, you're getting better every week, but you're only doing, you know, because you only get three minutes at a time. That's it. Now, it sounds like it's very little amount of time, but trust me, you get on a comedy stage, Three minutes is an eternity, right? But you only get three minutes at a time. So he recommended what I should do is go and find some places, little bars, little mom and, dad, mom and pop stores, cafes, whatever, coffee shops. Go there and offer to do a comedy show for free or for like 50 bucks. And just very little money, but just say, hey, I want to bring some friends. We're going to come here and do a comedy show. And most places who are trying to just sell beer or whatever, coffee, whatever, anything they could do to get people to show up, they're willing to give it a shot. So I could usually get people to let me come in and do a comedy show. And so I would get some of the other guys who had been doing comedy a little bit longer, but had, you know, 10, 15 minutes of material. We'd get a bunch of them. They were excited to get to do more than three minutes. They would come out. Many times they would drive two, three hours to get to the gig, but it was stage time, so they were willing to do it. And we started doing it. And then other guys saw what I was doing, so they started doing the same thing. And we had built up a kind of a little network in the Kansas City area, whereas a stand-up comedian who was trying, you know, a new stand-up comedian, open micer is what we call them, could get on stage every single night of the week and perform. And we were having a blast. Wasn't making any money at all. It was costing me a lot of money, but I loved it. Because I had a bigger, bigger picture in mind. And you know, this is one thing I learned very early with stand-up comedy, is you have to be willing to lose to win. You have to be willing to put in the effort to do the, do the hard work to, to, to see the big picture come into view. You know, I'd heard a, a thing back in, I remember junior high, I remember this little story they had talked about. A gentleman saw 
three, three men working on the uh, Notre Dame ca Cathedral. And he walked up to one of the gentlemen and said, hey, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm making bricks. And then he went to another gentleman and said, what are you doing? He says, I'm earning a dollar a day. And then he went to a third one. He says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a cathedral to God. And that really stuck with me. Because I thought about, you know, they're all doing the same job, all doing the exact same thing, but they all had a different perspective. And that's one thing I, I, I carried into the comedy was that I was willing to go and do the bad gigs. I was willing to go. In fact, I, I still do bad gigs because it's just part of the job. A few weeks ago, I got called on a Wednesday to go do a show up in Idaho Falls on a Thursday night at this room. It's called the Pepper Tree, if you ever want to look it up. It's known throughout the comedy world as absolutely one of the worst gigs ever because it's a bar, and directly after the show, they have a dance. And most of the people who come to the show early just start getting drunk early for the dance. So they sit there and tolerate the comedy. We just are background noise. They talk, they're loud, they're boisterous, they'll walk right in front of you during the show. And I've had two gentlemen who were trying to work on a sound system for the band that was getting ready to come the next day. And they were trying to figure out the sound system and talking to each other very loudly during my show. They were actually, and their speakers were louder than my speaker. And they, it, was, it was horrible. It was a horrible thing. But I loved it. Because those little challenges, those hard rooms, those are where you learn to do stand-up comedy. It's tough times. It's those tough rooms. You know, when you show up to a, a bar and they didn't even, half the people there didn't even know there was going to be comedy that night and you're going to try to entertain them, that's where you learn how to do comedy. You know, it's a, it's a thrill. Um, now, I've had, I've had other comics who would get upset about those kind of situations. And one thing I've always said was you should appreciate the ones who are paying attention because those are your favorite people in the room. Anytime anyone's willing to sit and listen to you, you should, you should give them a show and have some fun. And then what happens, if you're having fun, you're just doing your thing, uh, what happens is everybody else starts paying attention. I like to call it the moth to flames theory of comedy. Uh, that is, if you're just doing what you're supposed to be doing, eventually you attract the ones you need to attract. They're going to find you. Um, and you just keep building on that. Willing to do the hard stuff, do the simple stuff. That's the other thing I've learned in stand-up comedy. It's a lot of little simple things, you know. As a, as a comedian, you get up here on stage and everybody thinks, okay, you just tell jokes. You're just, you write some funny things and you get up there and say them. I wish it were that easy. I wish it were that easy. Um, because you have to learn how to perform your material. You have to learn how to entertain people and have a fun time. And it's different from just getting up and saying things. You have to perform what you're saying. You have to believe what you're saying. You have to believe that everything you say is the funniest thing that's ever been said and deliver it that way. You have to believe in all your material, even if it sucks. That's the other thing. Be willing to suck. Because when you first start doing whatever it is that you're doing, you're going to suck. You're going to suck really, really bad. Enjoy that. That was one thing I decided about when I started doing stand-up comedy, was I was horrible at it. Because I'd watch all these other comics, and they were amazing. Um, have you, any of you ever heard of a comic named Chris Porter? Look him up if you ever get a chance. He was on Last Comic Standing. He's very... Very funny gentleman. He was just ahead of me. You know, he's, he'd been doing comedy for a couple years when I first met him. He was getting into featuring. So he wasn't a headliner, but he was like kind of a mid-range comic. And uh, I remember watching him one night. He just absolutely just destroyed the room. It was amazing. He was brilliantly funny. And then the next week, it was horrible. 
He was doing different jokes, and it was horrible. I was like, man, what happened? He was really funny last week. And then I'd see him the next week. He'd come back with the same jokes, and all of a sudden, he was killing again. That's when we realize you, there's always a learning curve. Whatever it is that you're doing, there's always going to be a point where you're just not doing it right. Um, just be willing to just trudge through those moments and get through it. Because you really have to just get going. You know, when I, first, when I started doing comedy, my first thought was, hey, I have to wait for everything to be perfect. I have to have the perfect outfit. My hair has to be perfect. I've got to have the perfect jokes. I gotta have the perfect pair of socks on. Everything has to be perfect. I have to be the perfect weight, you know, the perfect compl- everything. I th- I had the idea of what I would look like. That would be the perfect comic. That was what I was gonna look like. I was gonna be that guy, and it never happened. And it still is never gonna happen. I know. I've tried everything. This, I'm stuck with this. All right. So when you, you keep thinking, and I think business is the same way, you know, anything you do in life, if you keep thinking, I have to wait for all the planets to align, I've got to wait for the temperature to be right, I've got to wait for the right person to show up, you, you get in your mind, I have to have all these things in a row to make this work, it'll never happen. It's never the right time, if that's what your, your mentality is. When it comes right down to it, the best time is just now. Just start doing it now. Whatever it is that you want to do, start doing it now. And start thinking of everything that you're doing is part of that process to get where you want. You know, when you go out hiking and you see, you know where you want to go, you know, top of a mountain, you want to get to the top of the mountain, you just keep going there. All the little things that you have to do to get you to the top of that mountain is part of the process. Enjoy it. Never think of yourself as, as being too low or too important to do the small stuff. In fact, I'm helping right now open another Wise Guys downtown at the Gateway Center. Before I came here today, I was mopping floors and putting tables together. Now, I, could, I have enough money. I could pay someone else to do it. But to me, that's part of the process of being, being involved with every aspect of a business. I just love the comedy business. So any part of it that I can be a part of, I want to. I want to know everything. I've waited tables. We had one time, we had a a club up in uh, Trolley Square. We had hired this manager and he had a lot of issues. So we had to let him go. He finally, he he moved on and uh, we were stuck. You know, we needed someone to not just run the club, but it was also a full-time restaurant. And so I stepped in and was willing to do whatever is necessary. I had nights where I had to help work the front, front desk, cook, wait tables, and do the show, MC the show. So I would be up there and do a few minutes of jokes, bring up a comedian, run in there, cook a steak, a salmon, you know, drop a couple French fries, hit those in the past, run back out, hey, give it up for that guy, do a couple more minutes of jokes, bring him another guy, run back and do the same thing again. But I loved it. It was just part of what, it, what we had to do. Um, uh, in fact, I remember starting Wise Guys. Um, was a lot of fun. Because what we had done, as I was run- she was talking about, I was running shows at Jordan Commons, and we would get the late night, like 11, 10.30. So, you know, we lost some of our audience because they had to go home before the Holy Ghost went to bed. But, but so we would do these shows, and we would do stand-up comedy, hypnosis, improv troops, whatever we could get. We'd, we'd fill up these theaters. And it was a lot of fun, but we knew that if we had our own club, we could have more control, we could bring in different acts, we could do shows earlier. We could just, we knew, it was, we knew it was the right time to do it. There was only one other comedy club in Utah at the time, and it was out in Midville. And the guy that ran that show hated anybody from Utah. He did not want to use any Utah comedians at all. So he always brought in outside acts, and he had, 
it basically, he had chosen the dark side, is what I should say, because he was all, all of his shows were very dirty, very filthy. Um, he was very particular about that because that's who he wanted to cater to. That was his market, he felt. In fact, at the time, I remember he used to have a sign that when you walked, first walked into the comedy club, before you bought your tickets, it said, F you. If you are effing offended by the F word, please leave now. We hate you. You're an effing idiot. F you. <laughs> so it let you know exactly what you were about to go into. So if you walked past that sign, you had no excuse. There was the, if you're getting offended after that, that was your problem. But we had a, we had a very different vision of doing comedy. Uh, and that's, you know, that's one of the challenges. This is one of the reasons that a, um, a major comedy club never came to Salt Lake was one, they're scared of our alcohol laws, but two, they're just scared of us because they don't know how to, how to deal with the strangeness of Utah. Because if you think about it, the people who would go to a comedy club because it's clean won't go because they assume it's not going to be clean enough. And then there's other people who won't go to the comedy club because they assume that it's going to cater to the people who want it clean, so they think it's dorky and won't go. So this is, this is what we were up against, what we were doing. And that's why he had decided to just go with the other way. He said, I'm, this, is who I'm, this is my market, this is who I'm going for, and that's who I'm going to cater to. So we decided there was a larger market that didn't, you know, that didn't necessarily want to hear it filthy, but didn't necessarily need, you know, uh, you know Jesus wants me for a sunbeam jokes for, for hours, right? We had to find this happy medium. Well, anyway, we decided to start, he, Keith had been, Keith Stubbs is the owner of Wise Guys. He had been running a, a club up in the Sugar House area in the basement of a, of a pool hall. He was doing shows there pretty regularly. And then I was doing shows at Jordan Commons. We were helping each other out with, with everything. He'd come and work my room. I'd work his. Um, finally decided, let's just do our own club. So we started looking around, and we found the location that's now in West Valley. It had been abandoned for about seven years. It used to be a church. It was a, in fact, I think one of the funniest jokes I ever told about it was our first comedian who headlined in that club. His name was Kermit Apio. And he goes, I... I got to commend everybody for being a part of this wise guys thing. I mean, they tell me it used to be a church. That takes some tenacity when you think, hey, God felt here, but we'll give it a shot. Um, and from the day that we got the lease signed for that property until we opened was two weeks. If you've ever opened a business, that's pretty freaking amazing. And why? Because we were motivated. We didn't have a lot of money. So we, had, we, were, we were basically opening that, that comedy club on hopes and prayers. I had, uh, at the time, I was living in a, uh, as Jim was saying, I lived in Lehigh. We were living in a barn. My in-laws had an apartment that they had added into the, in this barn that they had just built. And that was always weird because when the kids left the door open, I didn't know what to say to them. You're welcome. Anyway, so we were there. That was my situation. I was working at UTA, and I quit my job at UTA to go into the full-time to open this Wise Guys, this comedy club. My in-laws were not very happy, but I was willing to do it. So we started. And when we started, we, you know, the biggest challenge when you first start a business is just letting people know you're even there. And we were doing everything we could. Still, we were on a budget, so we were... We were doing all kinds of guerrilla techniques. We would get passes and go and hand them out to all everybody in the mall. I'd go to businesses, walk in and say, hey, guess what? Your business is so amazing. What do you guys do here? Oh, yeah, fantastic. You guys built cabinets. That is fantastic. Guess what? We want to give you guys a company party. Here's a, How many people work here? Oh, there's 40 of us. Well, fantastic. Here's a pass for 100 people to come and see a comedy show for free. And what would happen is they would, hey, we got a comedy. And these people would show up. They would come and see the show and then tell their friends, maybe buy a Coke and then some nachos, and so we'd make a little bit of money. But then people would tell everybody, oh, hey, there's actually a comedy club that's well, it's not going to insult you. 
And so that's how we started building it, was just, just kept doing it. We knew what we were doing was going to catch on. We knew that people in Utah enjoy laughing. And we were, gonna, we, we were focused on that. So we just kept plugging away, plugging away, plugging away. And uh, we got people to show up. It was pretty amazing. You know, we had, we had nights. We'd have 16 people. And then the next night, we'd have over 300. And it was, you never could get a read on it sometimes, but you just, just kept plugging away because we believed in what we were doing. We were, and more importantly, we were having fun. It's one thing I tell people when they start doing comedy. Just have fun. If you're up there having a good time, they're going to have a good time. You know, if you ever get on an airplane, I don't know if you've ever noticed, if you ever get on an airplane, you'll notice something. The pilot always speaks to you. Have you ever noticed that? The pilot always gets on there and goes, to, uh, I'd like to tell, uh, this is your pick this speaking. We're going to be flying at 35,000 feet. We expect a little bit of tailwinds. Uh, but we expect a safe, comfortable flight. Sit back and relax and have a good time. You know what I'm talking about? It's always very dry, matter-of-factly. Do you know they're taught how to do that? Because they want you to think that that guy is bored to some extent of what he's doing. Why? Because he's so good at it that he's not worried at all. So they tell him not to sound excited. You just... Very confident, I know what I'm doing, thank you. Have a drink, have some peanuts, relax, we'll get you there. It helps you ease your mind. Well, comedy's the same way. When somebody gets up on, on the stage and they're nervous and they're not sure what they're doing, you get a little uncomfortable and then you're not, you don't know what to do. But the, confident, the comedian's up there and he's confident, competent, knows what he's doing, having a good time, you go along with him. It's a little ride. So have. Have fun. That is the, that's probably the biggest thing. Just have fun whatever you're doing. Life is too short. I, you know, why spend your entire life building a business for something you hate? Just have fun. Find something. That was probably the biggest lesson I've learned in life is when I realized that money does not motivate me. When I finally realized that just trying to make money wasn't getting anything done for me. When I stopped thinking that way and just started thinking, I'm just going to do what I love and hope it shakes out somehow. And so that's what I started doing. And uh, comedy was doing well. Um, and then we eventually moved from Utah. We moved to Texas. My wife got a job uh, at, a, at a college uh, doing drafting work. So we moved to Texas. And I started going on the road as a comedian. I did six weeks in a row for on the road. I was gone. And I remember sitting out there. Whenever I was on stage, I was having a good time. But sitting in a 1960s-style motel somewhere in Montana makes you start rethinking your life choices at that point. And uh, I'm thinking, wow, when I'm on stage, I'm good. But when as soon as I get off stage, I'm miserable again. Because, you know, I'm away from my wife, away from my family. I, I like the kids at that time. Um, <laughs> so I didn't want to be on the road all the time. I just, I just, I just didn't want to. I didn't like it. And uh, so at the end of that six-week run, I went back to Texas and... Uh, Decided to start a business, start doing something that I could make money at that would still give me the flexibility to do comedy and, and acting. And so that's how I, f I started just searching. I thought, well, what, what am I willing to do? What kind of a job do I want to do? And one of the things I enjoy is, ex is new experiences. I enjoy traveling. I enjoy new experiences. And so as I started looking, we, we, there was this business that I had tried before and never did, did okay with it. Um, and what it is, and this sounds silly, most people I explain that this is actually a thing, they don't believe me, but mortgage companies will pay you to drive around and look at houses. Did you know that? Yeah. Well, here's, here's what happens, is when you sign your paperwork for a mortgage, one of the papers you sign is you give the mortgage company the right to inspect and, walk, and look at your house 
um, that if they determine that there's anything wrong with that property, that you're not caring for it, they have the right to go and take care of it. Specifically, it's used in the cases when people abandon the home. A most, most typical scenario is that, you know, a couple gets married, they buy a house, they're there for a few years, they have some financial troubles, they start to hate each other, so then they just say, screw you, I'm leaving. The other one says, screw you, I'm leaving. I hope this house burns, and, you know, they both leave, right? Both of them stop talking to the mortgage company. Meanwhile, the house sits there empty. Varmints move in, vagrants move in, pipes burst, house goes to pot, and then by the time the bank actually is able to foreclose on it, their investment is destroyed. And so what they do is they send people out to just kind of watch after those properties. And once it becomes vacant, they can go in and secure it and take care of it, even before the house is foreclosed on. And so that's where I got this silly little idea, this job, was they pay people to go do this. Hey, why don't they pay me to go do this? So I had something I could go and do during the day, make some money. Um, as soon as I was done and turned everything in, I was done with the job. I, there was no, if I couldn't go out the next day, I could just tell the people, hey, don't give me any more work right now. It was just completely up to me how much I did. So it was like, if I had days I wanted to make a lot of money, I got up early and I worked all day, made a lot of money. If there's other days I wanted to go fishing, I could go fishing. It was a great job. So I started doing it by myself. In fact, I remember my told my wife what I was doing. She's like, no, okay, explain this again. I said, I just drive around like houses. And they give me money. <laughs> She's like, you're out of your mind. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I said, no, I'm telling you, they're going to give me money. It took four weeks before I got any money. So it was four weeks of my wife just going, whatever. You know, at this point, she's thinking, you know, maybe you should go back and sell Malaluka or something. That actually has a business model. Um, and then a check came in the mail. We got a check. And at that point in time, it would just be every day that you would turn in work, the company I was working for would just send you a check four weeks later for that day. So every day, it became a little adventure. Every day I opened the mailbox, I could have one check, Four checks, ten checks, no checks. Some days the checks would total a couple hundred bucks. And then one day, it was typically it was running around about 50 bucks here, 100 bucks there, 20 bucks, 100 bucks. And then one day I got a check for $1,500 for one day's work. My wife looked at that and said, okay, explain to me what you're doing. <laughs> what is this? And then she started helping me. She started making maps. She started plotting everything. She became involved with it. And then it got to the point where my wife's job, where she was making $25 an hour, was costing us money every time she went to work. Because we could make more money doing this business. And so we built it and built it and built it. And what had been originally just a way for me to make some money so I could be irresponsible and do crazy things on the weekends with comedy and acting turned into this full-fledged business. And we eventually had to hire on more contractors to help us out. And we currently do about 15,000 inspections a month uh, throughout New England and parts of uh, San Diego, California. Um, the job has taken me from, we had one year, they lost an inspector in Hawaii and just called us and said, hey, do you have anybody that can go work Hawaii? We figured a way to do it. It was awesome. It was awesome. So I had, I had a year where I would fly to Hawaii for three weeks, work, and fly home for a week for a vacation, and then fly back to my job in Hawaii. Just driving around looking at houses. It was, it was a lot of fun. And it was just because I was willing to do the weird things willing to just do the strange stuff. There's all kinds of these opportunities out there. Um, they pay people. Um, one of the things we, I was starting to get into uh, was they pay people. Harley-Davidson pays people to go and find motorcycles 
And if you go, if they have one that, you know, people are trying to hide, that's trying to be repossessed, they'll pay you a couple hundred bucks to just go and figure out where it's at. You don't even have to go get it. You just have to figure out where it's at. So, those kinds of things. It's an adventure. It's fun. It's fun. You know, we, and, but we'll, we'll drive like houses. When houses get foreclosed on, we have to go and do the basic inspection to make sure that the house is being taken care of. Um, so, you, you just, you meet a lot of nice people. You also meet a lot of not nice people. But it's always an adventure. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, I would like to say, um, now, you know, the, the important lessons I've learned about, biz, about doing stand-up comedy that have applied to me and doing business um, is one, have fun. Just enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy the ride. Have the big picture in mind and just remember all the little stupid things that you have to do help you get to where you want to be. No job is too small. Everything is important. It's all important. Can you get that? I'm a little busy. I'm, no, that's all right. I was going to get really mean, but we're not in a comedy club, so. Is it important? Do you need to get it? Is there no. kids okay? Oh, it's just an alarm. Okay, am I done? Um, uh, but will be willing, to, okay, first of all, you're never going to be the perfect time to start. Just do it. Just get started. You know, it's just like writing a term paper. You write the first one, it's horrible, and then you rewrite it and you rewrite it, but you never are going to actually get it finished until you start the rewriting process, because that's when you actually do a good job. Your first draft is horrible, right? I mean, well, ladies, you guys are always, you look like you guys are awesome at it. Probably nail it the first time, but for the rest of us, you suck. Everything you do in life is going to be the same way. You first start, you're going to suck, because you're not going to be focused. You're not going to be sure what you're doing. You're still learning, except the fact that you suck. Because once you get started, that's when you start making the changes. That's when you start learning. That's when you start figuring out what needs to be done, how to do it, all those things. All the pieces start coming into play once you start doing it. So don't wait for the perfect time. That'll never come. Your perfect time is just now. Um, don't worry about trying to appeal to the market to everybody, because you're not going to, especially nowadays, everything is so specialized that now you just find who your niche is. One thing I have found in comedy, just like anything else, people associate with you because something about you says something about them. You know, you don't walk around with an anthrax t-shirt because you are a religious person, although that you could still could be, but you wear the anthrax t-shirt because it says something about your character. It says something about you, or ACDC, or whatever. Superman t-shirts. It says something about who you are. It says, you know what, I'm, I'm a little crazy, I'm a little old school. That's cool. So as a comedian, or any other product, any, you know, and as a comic, you have to think of yourself as a product. I am the product, I'm trying to sell me. And a couple things I, I know about people is everybody thinks they're really smart, Everybody thinks they're really attractive, and everybody thinks they're really sexy. This is my challenge. I'm none of those. <laughs> so as a comedian, I have to figure out what is it about me that people will, will, will find interesting. Still, still struggling with it sometimes. But you're, you're going to find your market if you're just true to who you are and what you are and what you're doing. Too often, I find comics who will come in, they start doing all kinds of weird jokes, you know? I have this, this one friend of mine, and it's just the funniest thing. He thinks of himself as the rock and roll comic, right? He always wears a, a Levi vest with the sleeves cut off and, you know, Megadeth t-shirt or whatever. He's always got the arm tattoos and everything. But he looks like a child. He has the face of a boy. He's 20-something years old, looks like he's 14. And his entire set talks about his mom. I'm like, I think you're missing the point of the rock and roll comic, and you're doing this. So he's, well, he's funny. He's a very funny gentleman. gentleman but, uh, so yeah, there is, there's my words of wisdom, my friends. I hope, that, I hope you've gained something from it. 
Um, what have I done to overcome the fear of public speaking? Um, probably the, the best thing is when you realize that in order to be a really good comedian, you have to be willing to look stupid. And so I've embraced being stupid. I've embraced being an idiot. I've embraced it. I expect every time I get on stage for it to fail miserably. And in doing so, I take all the pressure off myself. And I just let it happen. Because what I find in my business is the more ridiculous and stupid I look, the better I do. And it's the same way with everything. People love people who are honest. And if you just get up there and you're nervous and silly and you admit to being you're nervous about it, the audience is going to go with you. The audience is on your side. If you, the trick to being successful is, and people used to say it was to get people to like you, you know, have people like you. No. Like, people liking you is good, but when you really build an audience, it's because they care about you. And the way you get the people to care about you is you bring them into your world. You're never going to get every, you're never going to get into everybody else. You know, people will say, relate to your audience. You need to study your audience and know them and do jokes about them. Eh, don't waste your time with that. You're never going to get to everybody in the audience. But what you can do is get the audience to come into your world. You can get them to relate to you. And that's where it is. Because when I get on stage, I'm just talking about me. I'm just talking about my stupid life. So... All right, thank you very much.